We see hundreds and thousands of successful and unsuccessful proposals. And it is disappointing that sometimes that's, you know, taken for granted or it's not recognised. I think we have a responsibility there. I think we need to get better at talking about the added value and what we can do. Hello there, I'm Sarah McCluskey and this is Research Adjacent. Each episode, I talk to amazing research adjacent professionals about what they do and why it makes a difference. Keep listening to find out why we think the research adjacent space is where the real magic happens. My guest for this episode is Lorna Wilson. Lorna is Director of Research Development and Operations at Durham University and, as of the 1st of August, also the newly minted chair of ARMA, the Association of Research Managers and Administrators. According to her Twitter profile, she also has multiple black Labradors, and if I had known that in advance, there would have been way more dog chat in our conversation. But that said, I have known Lorna for a long time, so maybe I should have known. I met her not long after she started at Durham University, and she so impressed my old boss, Jane McNaughton, that we were sent off for coffee together. Even then, I remember that Lorna was raving about how much she loved Arma, so I suppose it's no surprise that she is now leading the organisation. But like so many of my guests, she got into this work completely by accident after taking a temp job at Newcastle University. Listen on to find out more. Welcome along, Lorna. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Right. Oh, you're welcome. So I wonder if, first of all, you could tell people about what it is that you do. So I am Director of Research Development and Operations at Durham University, where I'm one of four co-directors that lead research innovation services. We are responsible for supporting all types of research and research-related activity. So that can be everything from an external funding application through to, you know, you need some support with an export control license, or you want to work with an industry partner or do a regional project. We do lots of different things. My particular remit, eh, I'm responsible for development, which is all about support, research development, sorry, all about support for kind of longer term strategic initiatives. So usually bigger bids that are usually interdisciplinary, you know, multiple partners, eh, lots of people coming together. Our research operations team, so that is all the pre-award, contracting and post-award activity. So they lead and manage the submissions of all the external applications that they do. Um, And they're the biggest team that we have in RIS and they're Mm -hmm. the team that most of our academic community engage with. And then also research culture sits with with myself uh, along with strategic, strategic projects, which is a kind of relatively new unit that we've been building to support things like uh, some new capital opportunities and really significant research initiatives uh, that are not your typical kind of funding funding proposals yeah oh sounds like a lot of things that I'd really like to dig into as we go (laughs) through this conversation how did you find yourself coming into this role what's been your career journey so like many a research manager around me uh, completely accidental Uh, so (laughs) I (laughs) sadly didn't grow up wanting to be a research manager I hope that will change for people in the future but yes I had you know I did my undergraduate degree at Strathclyde in Glasgow I worked for a couple of years in the third sector for Bernardo's divisions uh, one of which was looking after children at risk of being accommodated one of which was looking after children at risk of sexual exploitation Um, and at the time I wasn't quite sure I wanted to do so I spoke to a, a previous lecturer and ended up coming and moving to Newcastle and doing a master's in, in social research and sociology which I loved um, and I finished my master's on the Friday and had to pay my rent so went to the temp <laughs> agency who were like oh there's actually an administrative job at Newcastle University um, and that's kind of how I started working for uh, an education institutes. I had no idea the type of jobs that were there or what you need you know I'd been to two universities by that point but I just had no idea what was going on um yeah. and then the next kind of two or three years I did a number of different jobs I worked in kind of education facing roles supporting students I supported some CPD and professional um kind of outfits as well and then I just found myself in a faculty job and started to hear about research. So I, I've supported research groups and conferences. Um, and then I was also given additional responsibilities. So I, I did some support for REF 2014 and had a great boss there, also called Lorna, funnily enough, <laughs> who gave me lots of different opportunities. And that's where I really started to get into research is really exciting and Mm -hmm. I hadn't had a clue what I wanted to do but I knew I loved working with people um, and 
that sort of search is, is really about. Um, mm-hmm. And then an opportunity came up in the kind of funding advisor space. And I never thought I'd get it. I thought it sounded like such an exciting job. But I thought it was a, in a couple of grades up and I was like, oh, I'm not quite sure if I'm going to be able to do this. But I'd had previous experience in one of my junior grades where I'd been given the opportunity to write some tenders for companies for leadership mm-hmm. programs and I'd done some pitching and things. So I felt I could at least try and demonstrate I had transferable skills and I ended up getting offered the job and a really big thing at the time I was told was I got offered the job because I was enthusiastic about it um, <laughs> and they thought they would give me the opportunity you know to try and, and train me up and see and I have not looked back since then like mm. research development and funding I am obsessed and I think ever since then I've you know moved into my development manager roles and then kind of became head of research development and now I'm in a director position and that's kind of how I ended up here so it yeah. seems quite random at the start but it's kind of nicely you know I was really you know benefited from having some really great people around me to help in terms of like developing those transferable skills and being able to access those opportunities. Yeah I think that's a really common story with a lot of people I talk to is that they started off not really knowing but then they found the thing and and went for it so uh, yeah it definitely sounds like that for you and something that some people listening to this might not realize how much input comes from people like yourself to funding applications I think people think that it's all comes from the academics but maybe you could tell us tell anybody who's under that illusion what actually goes into it yeah I mean it's it's something that thankfully now is getting more spotlight and attention but it's you know, it's one of the reasons why I, you know, used to love my my job so much because I felt like I was making such a contribution to to research and and to to colleagues' work. I think the big thing is is, is understanding it's the added value that we bring, and then um, people bring it in different ways, obviously, and it can be anything from you know working with a research administrator who's helping an academic understand how to resource a project properly mm-hmm. because if you don't resource a project properly, you can't do it. Yeah. And you can't do it to the best of your ability. So, you know, it can be anything from that through to, you know, the colleagues that help with idea development and concept mm. development. You know, they might bring together partners that help to support you and that project. A really big thing that we do a lot of is almost like coaching and it's mm-hmm. around ambition. And someone might come to you and be like, oh, I'm not quite sure. I had this random thought in the middle of the night that was a great <laughs> idea and I thought we could do something. And the next thing you know, you, you know, you've got a three million pound consortium together <laughs> yeah. to deliver this really exciting initiative. So the very there's various ways that we contribute. And I think there are some academics that truly work in partnership with us that recognise I am more likely to win my funding if I work with the teams because they are bringing their expertise to this. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are. We are experts in in research funding, for example, when it comes to development and and pre-awards. We see hundreds and thousands of successful and unsuccessful proposals. And it is disappointing that sometimes that's, you know, taken for granted or it's not recognised. I think we have a responsibility there. I think we need to get better at talking about the added value and what we can do. Um, and I also, it's one of the things where, you know, you do, people work with you when they know you. So yeah. you need to make sure that you're not just, you know, speaking to those people and it's just those people that access your support. It should be, you know, everybody that can get to it. But I think it's it's really interesting, like when I think about projects I worked on, the it was different types of contributions I made, mm-hmm. sometimes very significant over a number of years. Sometimes I might have just been reading a draft and telling somebody that I had no idea what they were actually doing because it wasn't yeah. written, you know, <laughs> written particularly well. So it really varied across the years. But I do think it's I'm really pleased that more attention's now coming to that. But I think we've still got quite a long way to go. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, but the more we start to have these conversations and and chat about it, the better, I think. And I wonder if you've mentioned there that you've been, you've seen hundreds, thousands of funding applications over the years. Are there any that really stand out or things you've been involved with that you're really proud (gasps) of? Yes, there are. I mean, you remember, I always remember the first, one of the first big projects I worked on which was my first job like a long time ago mm-hmm. was a it was a big Welsh language corpus that was mm-hmm. led by a colleague she now I believe works elsewhere so she's not at Newcastle anymore which was my first institution but that was a huge kind of 1.7 million pound project she'd never had a big grant or standard grant mm-hmm. before she was jumping from quite a small seed cord amount into this and she had a really experienced 
um, kind of collaborators with her, which is how she could make the case for leading it. She worked so hard on it. And I just remember when that was awarded, it was great. But then I remember soon after it got awarded, they poached her away to the, oh. <laughs> the other university. But things like that you remember. And yeah, I, and like I said earlier, you know, where I truly worked in partnership with colleagues, where I felt like they, you know, were kind of had respect for what I was going to be able to to deliver with them. I say with them, not mm-hmm. for them. Yes. Because it's the research, you know, that we're there to to help cultivate and, yes. you know, support. So and other things like particularly the things that took years, uh, they are the ones that stick in your brain. Another like another one would be it's now runs as the big living deltas hub out of Newcastle, but mm-hmm. Andy Large was the PI on that as a geographer. I worked with Andy on a failed Leverhulme Centre bid and then it was years until the GCRF hub came through and he did various activities across the years to develop it. And I left Newcastle whilst it was still, I think, between kind of outline and full submission and a, a number of colleagues uh, in Newcastle did so much work to, to, you know, to support that. But I was lucky because Durham were a partner, so we were mm-hmm. still <laughs> still involved. But that I really liked because I felt like Andy wanted, you know, he, a number of professional service colleagues were involved there and he had a lot of respect for our expertise he could rely on us we were a team mm-hmm. and that's that's where you that's what really really counts I think they're the good ones then you have the bad ones as well that I'm, linger I'm, but you know <laughs> maybe I'm sure you don't want to name names but maybe you could tell us about <laughs> some of the kind of experiences that have maybe left a bad taste I think the most disappointing experiences are where your your expertise has not been has not been taken on board mm-hmm. and um, you know a funding application isn't successful and it's directly the reasons that you said why it yeah. would be <laughs> you know and that's really disappointing because most of the time like colleagues will know you cannot resubmit the same ideas yeah. again so you know usually you're submitting to the best funder for your idea to give yourself the best chance and um and I did have an example where uh, a very senior colleague was going for a very big fellowship and they just would not take on board my feedback and they didn't get it. And what was really interesting was they came to me after they got the outcome to show me that the email feedback they'd had from the funder was almost identical <laughs> to the first lot of feedback I had sent them. And they had a lot of actually really appreciated that they did that because they didn't need to yes. at all. Yeah. And I, I did appreciate it. But it's just, I was disappointed because it was such an amazing project. Yeah. And I just thought, oh, yeah. if only. And yeah. it's hard to understand why. It's really hard to understand why. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, sometimes people find it, yeah, it's their baby, isn't it? And it's hard yeah. to let somebody else in and have an opinion on it. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Oh, well, it sounds like their, your experiences really resonate with a lot of the experience of other people that have been on the podcast and that I talk to around the dynamics within universities. And and you're also involved a lot as well with um, ARMA, aren't you? So the Association of Research Managers and Administrators, is that? Yes, it? yes correct. It correct. is. So what sort of ARMA's take on the current conversations around research culture? So ARMA has been really heavily involved in this. I think we see it as a real opportunity uh, because, again, really positive that the spotlight, you know, was put on research culture. You know, people were people have always been passionate about it and tried to, you know, do it really, some really positive role models there. But like I think we've all seen it's been really mainstreamed in the last kind of few years. And I think, you know, Welcome obviously put out their report initially about it and started to drive a lot of that. But ARMA thinks there's a real opportunity uh, for particularly kind of research management professionals because we are at the core of a lot of this activity, whether it's around how we design policies to ensure that they are supporting a positive research culture through to, you know, working with an academic on their responses to reviewers' comments and picking up on some of the cultural elements. Mm -hmm. ARMA's taken forward a number of different initiatives um, and we've got some exciting opportunities in the pipeline <laughs> um so one of them for example Hilary Noon who now works at UKRI who was previously at Newcastle Hilary led a, a huge survey that ARMA did around research culture and research managers and you can access that for free on our website it's a really interesting piece of work and it had some really interesting evidence that came out of it around our experiences and some of which was quite disappointing you know around you know experience of bullying and harassment and things but also I think a lot of what gave us hope in terms of you know 
people feeling like we all have a part to play in research culture but also you do not have a positive research culture if your research professional staff are not part of that yeah. it, it you, you sorry you cannot claim that at all so I think you can see in some institutions where they're doing more in that space and I think mm -hmm. ARMA what we're trying to do is think about how we can support the sector to do that so things like the survey that Hillary did working with some of the funders and some of the projects that we're taking forward I think it's going to be something that we definitely uh, continue to kind of pick up as a priority in the next kind of two or three years. Yeah excellent and you'll certainly have that be taking the lead on that as you're taking over as chair of ARMA. Yeah <laughs> yes so I'll take over as chair on the 1st of August, taking over from the very, very capable Jerry Johnson, who will be finishing up. And I think it is one of the things that we've been talking about. So there's some projects and with the likes of, kind of Research England and things that we're looking at. So it's a really big part of it. And I think because ultimately, you know, a priority for ARMA is uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, which is obviously mm -hmm. separate to culture, but is a big part of it. Um, and I think it as a, an organisation and how we want to function, how we want to, you know, benefit our members, culture is a huge part of that, you know, mm -hmm. feeling part of a community, feeling supported, feeling like you have development opportunities, uh, you know, that's really big in and on it of itself, but also how we can then work with key stakeholders to lobby them to support change, you know, at a higher level. Yeah. So yeah, it's exciting. I think ARMA has been a huge part of my career. I would not be in the position that I'm in without ARMA. And I mean mm. that from, you know, I did a qualification with them when I first got a research facing job. I went to the induction session. Yeah. And that, that was it. I was obsessed, I think, after that, you know, and it, I did everything from deliver training for them. I led on their research development special interest group. I did a whole host of things and, and then I got appointed to the board in 2019 as director of training and development and now you know taking on the role as chair so I'm really excited about having the opportunity to give back in terms of you know so that other people can benefit as much as, as I did from working to, to work with ARMA. Yeah and what do you think are the the real things that you gained from being part of that organisation part of that community? I'm I think one of the biggest things is just having a, such a good network. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really lucky in that uh, back when I worked at Newcastle, I had a great mentor through a leadership program I was doing. And she sent me across the road at the time to Northumbria where mm -hmm. Steph Bales was, who was the chair of ARMA then. Mm -hmm. And I had a chat with Steph thinking I'd just have a general discussion and hear more about ARMA. And I left having agreed to lead the special interest group around research <laughs> development. Uh, so I think just pu like purely from a networking point of view, and I mean, I am in a position of privilege in that, you know, the Russell Group have a network, the N8 have networks, so that I have other networks, but my ARMA networks have been the ones that on a personal as well as a professional, you know, level have really helped to, to support me. Mm -hmm. I think also just access to opportunities. So... I used to attend, you know, ARMA training myself. You know, we usually have speaker, you know, speakers from across the country. You get diversity of perspective, but there are people right on the front line in terms of, you know, leading on those initiatives, whether it's around things like the REF or whether it's around, you know, securing funding or post-award. I really have always liked that, that you don't just get, you know, one person telling you, how, you know, it's a mix. This is a mm -hmm. real benefit is you get a mix of perspectives. So you might be sitting in, for example, a less research intensive university where you are responsible for everything that another university have 40 people doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I always really liked that you got a diversity of experience mm -hmm. to hear from as well as benefiting from that from a you know, yeah. training perspective so yeah networking I think some of the training and then just the opportunities so just you know linking with particular stakeholders attending the conference both mm -hmm. from a professional but also it's a fun thing to do yeah. as well um and then some of the as I've become more involved in helping to support ARMA as an organization on the committees just what that opens up to you. You know, I already had quite strong funder relationships, for example, because of the role that I did. But, you know, I have even better relationships now because mm -hmm. of some of the projects that I've led with ARMA. So that's, I think, they're the kind of main ways that I've benefited. Yeah. Oh, it's great to hear that those opportunities to support are out there as well, because I think people often feel that within their own, within one institution, as you say, they might be quite a small team or there might just feel like there, are, there aren't opportunities where they are. So knowing that maybe if they become part of one of these networks, then that could develop open doors that they might not have expected. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, we're also, we are a member, you know, kind of a member led organisation. So we have a number of committees, working groups and things, which some people might be like, oh, 
I don't know about that but you know we're always looking for people to be you know get more involved and yeah. people usually you know we run a training course because someone said oh you know I'm quite interested in doing something in this you yeah. know you so you know that's how we end up getting involved in certain things and I yeah. think one thing I'd really encourage people is you don't have to be in a senior grade to be going for some of these opportunities mm. you know I think if you're interested you're passionate and you've got experience in your role you know that's what matters you yeah. know and I think a lot of the time people hold back I almost didn't apply for the board because I thought I wasn't too senior enough and I was told mm. by you know a, a close friend and mentor that I should stop being so stupid and apply for it you know it's <laughs> it's you know those types of things you know we benefit from so yeah. I would say if anyone's listening thinking you know they'd like to develop new skills or take on you know a new opportunity Arm is always uh, looking for colleagues to get involved and actually this is quite good timing because we oh. are going to have committee vacancies come out soon oh excellent so, yeah, so you know, well, maybe when this comes yeah. out, there'll be we can find those links yeah. and get them out yeah. there into the world. Great. And um, I often like to ask people if they had a magic wand and money was no object, what they would change about the world that they work in. And I guess you are going to be in a position to make some of those changes. Maybe not with the unlimited budget, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, that's a really interesting question. I think one of the things, I don't know if this is, one of the things I find quite frustrating is that the kind of element of competition mm -hmm. is, is, is so entrenched at times and it doesn't have to be. Mm. And I think, like, for example, you know, with Arm and some of our networks, you know, some colleagues will happily just openly talk to each other about problems about challenges about opportunities but there are there's still a sense because some people hold back and yeah. I just think things would be much better if everybody engaged in that open dialogue mm. and I do think a lot of the time that is perpetuated depending on leadership in certain institutions yes. and the culture that they have yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's just it's disappointing because it's competitive enough to win funding you know those types of things us talking to one another will only benefit all of us yeah. it, it, you know and I think that's one thing in particular that I find quite frustrating it's not it's not too grandiose actually it's quite disappointing <laughs> but I just think that type <laughs> of thing for me I think um, sometimes yeah. these small things are the things that make the biggest difference though aren't they you mm -hmm. know it's it's those it's like with the research culture stuff a lot of it isn't we're not talking about you know huge sweeping changes although some of them might be good but often it's that kind of interpersonal and you know better relationships yeah. and better collaboration and that sort of thing yeah. that would make all the difference absolutely yeah. if I'm allowed one other cheeky way yeah, go for on, it. I think the other thing would probably just be that general you know we're in a really difficult position around research because of the finances in the sector mm -hmm. So, you know, the reliance on international student fee income to prop us up. And that's very worrying. So if there was mm. some way to sort that out with a wave of the wand, that is a magic wand. But that, that would be a real magic wand moment, wouldn't it? It is yeah. indeed. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's that's having a really big impact on everybody. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see where that goes. Oh, well, thank you so much. I, I think we're just about the stage that we should think about wrapping up our conversation. But it's been so interesting, even though I've known you for years, there's things that there's things that I didn't know, which is always good. And um, if people want to find out or get in touch with you, whereabouts can they find you? Where What's the, what's the main place you hang out? Uh, I hang out on Twitter. I do yeah. like a tweet. Yes. Um, and I am on LinkedIn. So yeah. People oh, will be able great. to find me if yeah. anyone, you know, wants to ask about anything, whether it's armor related or otherwise, mm -hmm. please, please do get in touch. Excellent. Well, we'll put those links in the show notes and I'll also put a link to Arma and we'll find that report that you mentioned as well, that survey. Yes. We'll put that into the show notes as well. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of what I know is a very busy schedule to come along and have a chat. It's been really interesting. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Research Adjacent. If you're listening in a podcast app, please check you're subscribed and then use the links under the episode to find full show notes and to follow the podcast on LinkedIn, Twitter or Instagram. Also, make sure that you're subscribed to the Research Adjacent Roundup newsletter. You can also find all the links and other episodes at www.researchadjacent.com. 
Research Adjacent is presented and produced by Sarah McCluskey and you, yes you, get a big gold star for listening right to the end. See you next time.